asked me to, um, to uh, come to this meeting, uh, we had a discussion as to what we would, uh, we, we would talk about. Because we thought we had um, basically covered a lot of the items, uh, what the damage was like, and uh, some of the solutions when we, when we had the meeting here in 2003. So we thought it might be a good idea just to uh, step, uh, step everybody through some of the morphologies that, that we see. And so uh, what I'm going to do here is um, take, you on a, take you on a little tour of uh, phosphoritic materials and then uh, austenitic materials and uh, show, sh show you uh, just a small percentage of a very, very large database that we have of these oxides. So I've gone through all, all that data and tried to select uh, a number of samples that show a gradual progression. What happens as a function of time as you take these uh, as, as you take these materials, and so um, we call it OGI. So when we say OGI, we're going to talk about oxide growth and exfoliation. We thought it was rather a nice uh, little terminology to use, and uh, so. And I first of all thought about this uh, when I was talking to Ian. Now I I, I I don't know whether you can have a plural of déjà vu, can you? Uh, or whether you just have déjà vu, you know? So anyway, these are some of the things uh, that that you can uh, that you can think about, and uh, and how we, at each step along the uh, along the road here, we thought that we'd uh, solve the problem or got enough information to solve the problem. And the first one was the was the EPRI report, which was done at Leatherhead in the Oxide Group where I used to be, with uh, Mike Manning and Ed Metcalf. And uh, we thought it was all known. Uh, we thought it was all known at that time, but but no, short-term overheating failures kept occurring. And uh, I, I I I would ask. I don't know the answer, but how many have there been? You know, I've personally looked after about 30 of them around the world in nearly all countries of the world. And uh, and so I don't I don't know how many there are. They're a low frequency event, and in the big picture. They're not really a big item in terms of boiler tube failures. So somebody asked before about the cost. Uh, these tube failures are probably uh, tenth or eleventh in rank in terms of on a world basis. So there's not very many of them, but when they occur, they're a big they're a big event. And then at the um, at the NPL meeting, uh, we presented uh, the ferritics and austenitics, and we thought again that it was known. But uh, no, sorry, uh, I, I, again, again it isn't. And uh, in retrospect, uh, I, I think that uh, we concentrated in the 2003 meeting on some of the anomalies that take place. You know, it, it, when, when you look at these uh, uh, tubes and you have technicians uh, doing the analysis for you, they generally pick out the anomalies. And people like to show the anomalies instead of the norm. And so that might be one of the reasons. And then there's these new Oggy materials that have just been mentioned by Rudolf. But there's a continuing industry solid particle erosion. In, in our opinion, it's rare today. After all the work we did in the 80s, it's pretty rare in terms of an overall magnitude. Compared to what it was like in the 80s, nothing, no, uh, nothing comes close now. And the short-term overheating problems uh, that have been described here this morning by Paul and uh, Rudolf are continuing, but we consider them to be a low-frequency event, uh, expensive low-frequency event. And then there's some uh, issues with 91, and uh, and they basically can 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 lead to long-term overheating or short-term overheating, depending upon what the developing morphology is. So these are some of the things that I was thinking about. And then you look at the new materials, and you see uh, there's some worse situations. Uh, these ox these oxides are exfoliating earlier on some of these uh, on some of these newer materials earlier than the, the classic uh, materials that we talk about. So so uh, Ian and Stuart and I showed this slide in the 2003 meeting. This just gives you an, a, a, an indication of of uh, some of the things. And for those of you that that aren't in power plants every day like me. Uh, uh, so you'll have uh, solid, you can see solid particle erosion here. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is a short-term overheating uh, failure. And this is another one right here. And this is a, a little bit of oxide here that amazingly causes the damage. And uh, there's a new indicator that actually John didn't have on his uh, early slide. 
we're starting to see now um, deposition in the first stages of the turbine. So you can see it uh, right here, and it has a red color, and it even is starting to uh, cause efficiency problems and efficiency losses in the turbine. And, uh, and so we're actually using that deposit, if you can get a sample of this deposit, to be able to indicate to the operator of the plant that they have a solid particle, they have an oxide exfoliation problem. And you have to be able to distinguish the oxide, which you can see like here, this is a, a flake of oxide, uh, as against the deposition that takes place because of solubility issues. So if you have, if you have some aluminum, uh, or in England I should say aluminum, uh, uh, aluminum in the cycle, uh, or you have some copper in the cycle, then they have solubility issues and they and they lead, lead to deposition. And then quite often when you have that deposition, you'll see the oxide exfoliant. So in many plants now, we're able to take these deposits and show to the organization that they have an oxide exfoliation problem. And I'll show you, I'll show you some of them later. This is how we first came to identify that the oxides from T23 alloys are very serious exfoliators in steam. And I'll show you some of that a, a little later. So after that little bit of preamble, uh, I'm going to step you through this, uh, uh, first of all, with conventional ferritic alloys, and then some conventional austenitic alloys, and then look at some of those new, some of those new materials. And I'm going to show you some old stuff, and I'm not going to apologize uh, for it. And uh, it's a good job that many of you went here last time, because I can show things that I showed last time, and nobody will know about it. So that's so that's great. You and not remember anyway, though. Yeah. You can't rem I, I, can't remember, I can't remember stuff from yesterday. So I'm sure you wouldn't remember this anyway. But uh, so there's old stuff. And, and what, as I was putting this together, I was saying to Ian last night, you know, as well as Mike Manning and uh, Ed Metcalf in the group with us at Leatherhead, there was a guy called uh, Phil Bell. And he did some absolutely magnificent uh, metallographic work of all of these things. And so some of the things that I'm going to show you here are pretty much what, what Phil did back in 1978 and 1979. Sorry, I, 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 I was here then, actually. So. John, John sniggering at me oh, here, so. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So we're gonna talk about, first of all, uh, T11 and T22, pretty much the same, but I'm not gonna show you any T11. But, uh, you know, you, we've talked about this duplex oxide, like this. Um, and I was amazed that I first uh, used this in 1979 when I was in Ontario Hydro. But I think everybody knows it grows by a counterflux diffusion mechanism, and you get uh, oxide growing here, and you get oxide growing here. And uh, now I recognize that it's wrong because when you have the duplex growth, you don't have this uh, hematite. Very, very rarely any have, have any hematite on the outside. And uh, so now, what does it look like? So here's where I think that what Paul said, and what I'm going to show you here, varies a little different, because I don't see any difference in any country of the world. You're going to see many, many countries here covered, and we basically don't see any. I could, I could take a sample of this from China, from Hong Kong, from, from uh, Australia, from New Zealand, from anywhere. It'd be pretty much the same. And, uh, but what happens? Oh, I should just explain, because I'm not going to go th through them. Uh, on each one of these slides, you're going to see what the material is. Uh, sometimes you're going to see that it's in a conventional plant, that's a conventional boiler, or it might be in an HRSG. We don't see any difference between a conventional boiler or an HRSG, not, not, none at all. And uh, you're going to see the hours. In some cases, you're going to see the starts, the number of starts. And you're going to see two te maybe two temperatures. You're going to see an estimated temperature that we've made from uh, using the oxide thickness as it was just described, or you're going to see a steam temperature where we haven't made that, where we haven't made that assessment. But at these lower, at these lower temperatures, uh, you can maintain this duplex oxide here for a long period of time. And here you've got nearly 200,000 hours, and uh, you've got a, you've got the duplex oxide here. You don't see any laminations at all. No laminations along this interface. 
and you see and you don't see any hematite along the outside interface. And here's another one. So this is from a conventional plant. This is from an HRSG. Uh, this is one that we just looked at at the end of last year. Uh, and uh, you can see again this duplex nature of the oxide. And these two layers are approximately the same thickness. Approximately, we know they vary a little bit. And uh, you've got this uh, dark layer here in between, and we find uh, that this represents the original surface and quite often has a high manganese content for some reason. We don't un quite understand why, but quite often has a manganese content, and they're approximately of equal thickness. There's no laminations here on the inside, and there's no hematite on the outside. Uh, this light stuff is just the gold to, to protect the surface. And, but at some stage, at some stage, for each one of these alloys, you can start to see the formation of the laminations on the inside here. And you can just see two here, uh, right here. Okay? And, I am, and, and I'd like you to look at this here, the number of starts, because there's been a lot of discussion about starts and how starts cause these laminations to take place. But uh, you start to see these laminations along the uh, inside interface here, you still don't have any. You still don't have any hematite on the outside because there's not enough voidage in the oxide. And uh, unfortunately, the slide projector is not bright enough to show this. But uh, you have to take my word for it. You can see uh, when you map these. This is for iron here and chromium. You'll see these alternate layers right here. And uh, so here, here, when you have these first laminations. You've still got the original duplex pair right here. They're still whole. They're still visible. And uh, they're, sti they're still in existence with no hematite on the outside, uh, on the outside surface here. And then if you go a little bit further, as has been discussed, and Paul showed you some examples. I'm going to show you quite a few examples here. At the higher temperatures or longer times, then you start to get these multiple laminations on the inside. And so you can just about see them here. In this case, this was etched, so you can see them very clearly, these, this, this parallel array of multiple laminations, always as duplex pairs, multiple duplex pairs. And you can just about see, which is one of the things that becomes quite important, you can just about see here along this, along just in, the, in this part of the spinel here, you can just about see the remains of the original spinel. But it's not now a one-to-one -one relationship with the magnetite on the outside. And uh, you can see it a little clearer. You can see it a little clearer here. And again, we don't expect to see any hematite at, at this stage. So again, here's another, here's, here's another example. Uh, you notice these are... From many, from many different countries, not certainly not just from North America. And uh, again, you see this multi-laminated structure, and and it seems as you go with time that this spinel is consumed in some way by these multiple la laminated structures because it, it gradually disappears. That uh, the 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 original one-to-one -one magnetite and spinel disappears. The magnetite continues to grow but prob uh, probably at a slower rate. And uh, you can see it, uh, you can see it here, um, multiple laminations uh, here, right this, but you can also see the remains here, this bright part is where the original spinel was, and you can see the thickness of the magnetite here. So in no way does it match the thickness of the, of the magnetite now. So where is that original duplex pair gone to? Ha, ha, how has that changed from a situation where you have equal thicknesses to a situation where you have multiple laminations? And I think that this is a really key step that has to be understood because you won't get these uh, ferritic materials exfoliating unless they have these multiple, multiple laminated structures. You never get just the duplex pair exfoliating. So. Um, and again, so now if we look at a material that's just slightly different, this is a T12, and on, on, and on these slides I put the composition for you here, just in case you're not familiar with these. 
But this is T12 seems to behave the same as T11 and T22. And uh, so you see here the outer magnetite, you see the inner spinel layer here, multiple layers, and you see just the remains of the of that uh, of, of the original spinel. And you can see it over here in the etch condition a, 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 li a little better. So pr pretty much the same as what you see in T11 and T22. And here's a, here's an, here's another one with a with a chromium map here. And you can see very clearly uh, the, 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 the laminated structure, multi-laminated, multiple duplex structure, and the remains of this um, original spinel layer right here, which is this smooth area which sits just, just here. So either that uh, original spinel has been consumed and been made into the multiple laminations, or the magnetite has continued, continued to grow, and that original spinel layer has not. So um, I have to say I have to say here quite carefully, and the way the way that you usually do this when you have a name on a slide is say it has been suggested that, okay, and 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 uh, it has been suggested by a number of people, including Phil Bell back in 1978 and 79, that this laminated structure was due to these transverse cracks allowing the uh, the environment to come in, forming these multiple layers just like this. Um, I don't think I believe this anymore because, because you can see, as I've shown you a number of times here, very long lengths of parallel structures of those duplex layers. And of course, we don't see these, you don't see these transverse cracks in such a, in, in such a frequency <coughs> as, as you have here. And you generally don't see those transverse cracks until just before you have exfoliation taking place in these alloys. An example is shown in the Next slide here. So you can see right here uh, that here, here you now have a very large uh, multiple layer and you have these transverse cracks and these act as the centers for the exfoliation. And this is why you have very thick oxide from these ferritic materials and it's these materials that do the damage of the solid particle erosion. In the in the, uh, in, in, in the turbine, and you can get you can get exfoliation at at many of these locations. Sometimes here at the interface, and at, then at any one of these uh, locations that are corresponding to where there's a multiple <coughs> lamination. There's, there's lots of uh, voids associated with these, and as this as the density of the voids increases, you start to see the hematite on the outside surface. Now you can see the hematite right here. This is hematite going along the outside surface. But you generally don't see that until you get quite a thick uh, multi-laminated structure and these transverse cracks. So that's T11 and T22 and uh, pretty much the same for T12. So now let's have a look at this alloy, this 23 alloy, which is starting to be used in superheaters and reheaters. It's also used in water walls. Uh, we have a database on that as well. And this looks the same as what we've just been talking about, but has some, has some key differences. And so here's a couple of good examples. I want to just um, point out this to you here. Here's the composition that we measured for this particular alloy. I want to point out this here, this tungsten. 1.6% tungsten in this alloy. Not in, it's not in the other alloys. And now you can see excessive effoliation from this, from this alloy. It's only got 31,000 hours on it. And uh, it's uh, actually, this was one of the machines where we recognized the exfoliation event from the turbine analysis. And uh, this stuff uh, just comes off. You just touch it and it exfoliates. It's extremely brittle. It's extremely difficult to prepare metallographically, and it, it very, very difficult stuff. It, it just seems to exfoliate much worse than the, the, than the other ferritic alloys. And uh, so, when it exfoliates, it has it has a different exfoliate behavior. And again, I have to emphasize that we see exactly the same stuff in the boilers and in the HRSGs. Basically, no difference. So I.
thought I'd just, I'd, I'd just put in. At different places in the world, you see these different exfoliation events. So you could have had the, the original outer layer just exfoliate like this. You could have had the two uh, original layers exfoliate and another one come underneath. Or, because of the brittle nature of it, it could have happened as we were, pre as we were preparing it. And uh, Ian pointed out that there's really no regrowth on here. And so it, it, it could have happened during the preparation, or it could have happened just on the very last shutdown. So it, we also see the exfoliation through the, uh, through the magnetite itself. This is uh, through, the, through the original magnetite layer. This is the out, outer layer of magnetite here, and then here the, interface was, the interface was right here. So for some reason, this one went through the magnetite. Very, very brittle oxide compared to the others. And uh, here, the only purpose was to just show you, again, that this is a, 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 in an HRSG, and uh, it starts, it, it, this has only got 9,000 hours on it, and it uh, just starts to uh, produce these multiple lam laminations, as I showed you before for the T22. So from that point of view, it does the same. And here's, um, so it, 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 it looks, it looks uh, pretty much the same. Um, you can see the outer magnetite here. But now you don't see this, uh, you don't see this original magnetite layer. You see just these multiple laminations with lots of porosity and voids uh, between the, between the uh, duplex pairs. And consequently, because of this voidage, you see a lot of this hematite in the outside, in the outside surface here. And actually, I think that, I think that this here was caused by us mounting it, uh, just a, a, a brittle situation again. And uh, so here you can see in this, in this example that um, you can see the original magnetite here. You can see the original uh, remains of the spinel, which isn't the same thickness as this, but then you can see this multilaminated structure, which shows up a little better on the next slide here. And uh, so here you can see very clearly, here's the original magnetite, and this is the spinel layer right here, this darker one, and then you go into a magnetite layer. And if you look at this in detail, you see this sort of uh, this sort of appearance. There's no no cracking between these between these layers. There's a number of little voids here at, at uh, typical interfaces. Um, the thickness of these duplex layers is not the same. It varies right across the scale. It doesn't get to be a finer duplex structure as it gets nearer to the tube surface, like the like the like the two and a quarter chromes do. So it's a it's a little it's a little different. And uh, if you map it, you can see that the here, you can see quite clearly here the different thicknesses of these uh, laminations. Uh, varies quite a lot. And as you would expect, you see the silicon, the tungsten, and the manganese uh, exactly in the spinel part with the chromium. And uh, you, you can't see over here, but there's the magnetite parts in between. So. That's 23. Now, 90, 91, uh, again, super, so, sorry, well, 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 I'm going to stop the question. You can, uh, yeah, you can ask a question if you want to ask one. 20, your 23 example, one of them seems to have a design temperature of 622 Celsius. Yeah, yes, it did. Yes, it did. That, that and seems a tad hot to me. It, 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 it's, it was very hot for us as well. <laughs> yeah. Rudolph mentioned people don't always learn the lessons of the past. So yeah. Well, that's what it well we can't always tell the boiler manufacturers what to do, right? Sure you can. Yeah, we can, but whether, they, but whether they listen is a different matter. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad you noticed that. You were, you were awake. No. <laughs> good. And the scale thickness was like 500 yeah. micron. Yeah. Doing it in the early 80s, yeah. but you're not. 
not suggesting you're not suggesting that these scales are part of the uh, heat treatment, right? These are operationally grown scales. Mm. You're here, yeah. but I mean, uh, if, if, if you, if we have seen in some cases uh, for small boilers where, where they would accept it as a massive thing, that you have a very uh, poor ox oxide formation and you also have a bigger tendency to exfoliation. We, we normally clean all boiler, including second readings. Yeah, so did, and, so, and so did we used to as well.
1991, and they looked exactly like this. This was, but this was one that Steve Patterson and I uh, uh, looked at a couple of years ago. Well, back in 2003 here, or before that. And uh, in this case, they'd had a long-term overheating uh, failure, uh, similar to this, and very thick oxide layer. And you can see all the features again, exactly as we just indicated. The outer magnetite uh, the here, the lots of spin, uh, a hematite in the outside, and this uh, banded structure that's uh, full of uh, voids, which eventually join up and form this uh, very large void, which leads to the delamination event that takes place. And it seems that these 91 alloys uh, exfoliate by the delamination event. And, uh, and this, was one in, uh, this was one in Ireland that's, uh, that Steve Patterson and I looked up, but basically the same structure. I, I, I don't need to go over it again. And uh, this was an example that was presented at, at, actually at the 2003 meeting by, by Mitsubishi. Um, sorry, uh, uh, this one here. And uh, so it's the uh, same. And then this is a, uh, is a montage of uh, various uh, samples that we pulled together just to show how these, uh, this line of voids here eventually gets larger uh, as the hematite increases on the outside and as the voidage increases here in the inner layer in the banded structure and eventually gives rise to uh, this delamination. And if these are continuous, then a number of short-term overheating failures can take place, as well as long-term. You can have both short-term and long-term overheating failures in, in, the 91, in the 91 alloys. So this was an example in, uh, in an HRSG. <coughs> it, 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 sometimes in these HRSGs, as we, as we covered quite in detail at the last meeting, they have very, very severe thermal transients because of the condensate that comes back into, in, into the head of when the unit is uh, uh, starting up. And you can see example here. Uh, this is the startup of, uh, of an HRSG. And then at this point here, you get the condensate coming back into the cycle. And you get a very, very large thermal transient. This can be over 300 degrees here instantaneously. And so occasionally we see oxide like this in uh, 91 headers in, a, in, in HRSGs. And in this case, uh, very, uh, a little unusual, maybe because of the very severe transient, we just get the, we just get the, two, the duplex pair uh, exfoliating. So that's the ferritic, that's the ferritic side. Just let me uh, finish off here with the, with the osinics, which I think is a little, is a little uh, clearer. And so this, uh, this was an example. Uh, it's pretty similar to what uh, to what R Rudolph showed: the large flakes of uh, magnetite, a massive amount of it here. And then, if you take, we quite often just take a handful of this and just look at them, and they just show the typical structure that you expect: uh, the the, uh, the magnetite with lots of hematite on the on the outside uh, on the outside interface. And uh, this is an old. Uh, a, a diagram which shows the duplex uh, nature of the uh, of the of the oxides that grow on the osinitic, and as they uh, as this uh, spinel is restrained uh, from growing, and the outward movement of iron is slowed down, then you start to get these voids forming along the interface, and with time those voids link up, and they eventually uh, give rise to a hematite on the outside surface, and then exfoliation at this uh, at this interface. And uh, this is just a, uh, a, a time sequence just to show you here that uh, in this case here, there's uh, very little uh, voidage along the interface. There's no hematite on the outside surface or very little of it. And then with time, you can see that the line of voids here increases. And as the line of voids increases, you tend to get this hematite growing on the outside. And the next stage would be like this where it's nearly uh, gone right across here, just some voidage here, but you can see the hematite right here. And then the final stage just before it exfoliates is like this, uh, where there's almost a continuous voidage at the interface, and almost a continuous uh, hematite on the, on the outside surface. And uh, here's
here's a couple uh, more examples uh, that, 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 we, that, that we have that show pretty much the same uh, situation. One that's just about ready to exfoliate along this, uh, along this interface right here. But note the large amount of hematite in, in, the, in the outside. And this one shows it with it completely exfoliated. This one in very short period of time, uh, such as uh, uh, Rudolph just mentioned. And here's a, here's a, a quite a nice uh, sequence. Uh, uh, these are all from the same unit, just from adjacent tubes. So and if you start here, you'll see the, the duplex nature of the oxide, the magnetite, and the spinel. You'll note that there's no voidage along this interface, and there's no hematite along the outside, uh, outside of the magnetite. So this is uh, uh, intact and remaining uh, protective. And then in an adjacent tube, uh, you, you might find almost a continuous line of voids along the interface. And in this case, you would see an almost continuous line of hematite on the outside interface here. And here you would see a situation uh, in another adjacent tube that would be essentially just on the way to exfoliate and then in another adjacent tube where you would have only the spinel remaining and the, and the, and the outside magnetite has completely come off. So these are just in adjacent, in, in just in adjacent tubes uh, in the same, in the, basically in the same unit. And this is just a little schematic. It was suggested again that the, that the growth, the inward growth of the spinel is restricted by these chromium rich oxide precipitates. And as that takes place and becomes more complete, restricts the outward movement of iron, uh, gives rise to these little voids along the interface, forms the hematite on the outside, and then you have the situation for exfoliation. And uh, in the fine grain alloys, a little different to what a little different to what Rudolph showed, but we've seen we've seen this sort of thing in, in quite a f in quite a few units. Um, is that that situation, because of the fine-grained nature, essentially has a much more continuous uh, chromium oxide from uh, a layer here that's restricting the hematite, uh, that's restricting the, uh, the spinel growing inwards. And again, the same sort of situation t uh, takes place. And in this case, you, get, uh, you tend to get much more hematite than you do uh, for, the, for the coarse grain material. So that, that's why I asked uh, the question to, uh, to Rudolph before. And so, and we see, we see this, uh, the, the, this is, uh, this is uh, from a unit in Australia. And uh, these, we had quite a number of tubes taken out. Uh, and uh, you can see here just in this, the uh, almost continuous uh, hematite in the outside, and you can see it in detail here, and this is typically what we found in all the exfoliant that came out of this unit, handfuls of it, every one of them have, has, uh, has this high level of hematite in the outside. And uh, another, another uh, couple of units, but again, the same thing. You can see the, uh, you can see the line of voids here, you can see almost a complete uh, conversion to the, the to the hematite on the outside, and in this case, it's exfoliated and it's and it's regrown back as uh, as hematite on the outside surface here. And very unusually for an austenitic material is to see a laminated structure. You very very rarely see a laminated structure in in an austenitic in, in an austenitic alloy. And uh, you can see you can see it just here. Uh, so you have a uh, uh, magnetite on the outside here, they have this uh, laminated uh, structure, and then this is the uh, spinel um, on the inside. So, so that's uh, the, the, um, the austenitic materials. Now there's a, a, a little bit here that's, that's, uh, that's very important for, for us, that uh, especially uh, people like myself that produce uh, psychochemistry guidelines for, for organizations around the world. And uh, there's a lot of discussion, or there has been, almost in every single one of those 30 cases that I've been involved in, 
that it was the chemistry that was at fault. Initially, the chemistry is always blamed for, for, uh, for, for this. And in some countries of the world, uh, China being the main one at the moment, they adhere very closely to that, uh, that it's the oxygen, as uh, Rudolf mentioned, because uh, quite a lot of these uh, supercritical, all the supercritical units run with 100 ppb or more of oxygen. And, uh, and, it's, and it's misunderstood, we think, that this oxygen is the, is the cause of these failures. So if you go to units in China, they um, have to have a great amount of discussion to allow that chemistry to be used on those units. And uh, the only way that you can turn them around is to indicate that if you don't use, operate them with oxygen, they're likely to kill somebody because of something else in the plant. And so we've um, taken a lot, of, uh, a lot of time to try to understand uh, exactly what happens. And, if, and a few years ago, Ian produced uh, this uh, 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 compilation, if you like, which, which basically indicated that these oxides grow as a function of the partial oxygen pressure, and that the partial oxygen pressure that's available in, th in the steam under reducing conditions or under oxidizing conditions is far above the partial oxygen pressure that's required to grow these oxides. And uh, yet the, the, chi the, 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 chi the Chinese um, and a number of other places in the world continue to have this sort of misunderstanding about uh, what happens um, in, 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 the, in the steam and in the growth of these oxides. It's a, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big concern. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that as part of uh, such a group as this, or eventually, there'll be something that's maybe a little bit more definitive than this, that clearly, that clearly indicates that the chemistry isn't, it, it isn't the thing that's driving these oxides. And I think the confusion is, is that when you see this amount of hematite on the outside surface, the natural assumption is that that's because of an increased level of oxygen. But as I've, uh, as I've shown you here, that progression, that progression that takes place only takes place at the last stage where you get that hematite growing. Okay. And so you can have many, many examples that have sat there for hundreds of thousands of hours without any hematite there until you start to get those voids and where you get the reduction of the iron moving outwards. So this is, very, this is a very important point for us that are involved in power plants every day. And uh, so I think in, in summary, Ogi, uh, you know, I think we have a good morphological picture. Uh, we don't see really any difference uh, around the world when we take samples. We have many, many samples uh, coming in uh, every day. And we insist now that we look at them all from an oxide morphology point of point view. Um, I think that we've got a good picture for 91. Uh, we're trying to get the same picture for the 23 alloys because there's more and more of this being used in the, in the, in the superheater circuits. Um, we like to think that there's no effect of oxygen uh, or no effect of the chemistry of the steam. And, uh, and, and uh, the oxides on the T11 and the T22 are the things that lead to the solid particle erosion. Uh, and they have to be the multi-laminated oxides, as we as we just seen. The oxides on the austenitic can lead to the short-term overheating. They're those large flakes that you've seen many times this morning already. And the oxides on 91 can result in either type of overheating failure. And the oxides from 91 and 23 seem to be the ones that are responsible for these uh, steam turbine uh, uh, deposits. And so I just put a little slide here to say, do any, uh, do any alloys not exfoliate? And I think uh, we've already seen that Super 304 and those that are shot blasted on the inside seem to, uh, s seem to be okay. Uh, we don't have any experience at all of any exfoliation from Super 304 alloys. Okay, we don't have any. So I'd be interested to know if anybody has seen exfoliation or exfoliation that's causing damage in, in those. And I think the answer to Rudolph's question is, Definitely, if you put the fine grain and the shot blasting together, you'll have a good you'll have a good surface because we know the fine grain stuff already causes massive amount of damage. So if you but we don't have any indication from the shot blasted stuff. So I think that I think that that's uh, pretty clear. Um, how to keep the oxide in place? I don't know. Uh, how to, uh, how to remove them from the superheater? Uh, I'm sure that we're going to talk in the uh, 
uh, workout in the in the breakout sessions about that, uh, so I won't mention it. How do we encourage the oxides to exfoliate early or not at all? Uh, John mentioned that first thing this morning. We can now we can now indicate the plant. You know, <coughs> sh uh, shut the unit down for a certain number of hours till it gets to a certain number of temperature, three times a year or something like that. And uh, but can we can we develop an online indicator? Something like uh, acoustics or something like that that could that could hear the uh, the oxides exfoliating, and can we design can we develop an oxidation design limit? Uh, this is quite an interesting co concept because for the outside surfaces we already have that we already have an oxidation limit for all these materials from a phytocyte corrosion point of view or uh, or a high temperature overheating point of view. Could we use something like that for the internal surfaces as well? Um, and uh, how to prevent the oxides from from doing damage? Well, I think that in the in the in the solid particle erosion stuff, we already did that 20 years ago. I think we still got a long way to go for the for the tubing stuff, though. And uh, and so that's about all, uh, Tony, that I have. I'll just leave this. I I I, I put some acknowledgments here because there's a lot of people that have been involved in, in this with us over the, uh, over the course of the last uh, too many years, um, including the hundreds of utilities that have uh, provided, the, uh, provided the samples. Unfortunately, they only provide samples to us if they got some damage or they got a tube failure. 